Hi everyone, we are back from a much deserved break and we are ready to deliver some new content and also some old content. We decided that we just kind of evolved so much more. In since... general, we're new people. Yeah, All right. <laughs> don't talk to me about last year. I don't know her. Um, but really, we've we've evolved as a podcast. Um, our chemistry is a little bit more organic now in our episodes, and we just thought we kind of owe it to you guys to redo these episodes so that you can hear what we um, still obviously think of the cases, the good research that we did, but in a more organic and better way to tell the stories um, because these stories deserve to be tell, told as best as we can. Yeah, and since we're on this newer, better version, these old cases deserve yeah. the same. We are cleaning everything up. We're cleaning house. Right, we're, we're working shop, if whatever you, you call it. If you listened to our first few episodes, no, you didn't. <laughs> and sincere apology, but... <laughs> yeah, but it, that's why if it feels like in the middle of this episode, you're like, have I heard this case before? You have, if you're loyal, um, and, and if you haven't heard this case before, then you're an asshole. No, I'm you're just kidding. Big as <laughs> but no, so here it goes. We're now redoing the case of Hella Crafts. Hella Crafts was a flight attendant, a mother, a friend, so many things to so many people. But she will go down in history as the first murder case to be tried without a body in Connecticut. We are your hosts, Helen Allen and Sherry Ferreira. This is The Chalk Line. Good evening, everyone, and the highlights of the news this Thursday. Hella Lork Nielsen was born in July of 1947 in Denmark. She grew up in a small village north of Denmark, so they just kind of say, like, Denmark, which yeah, I don't... Yeah, with these small towns, it's always... It's two different towns, a whole city. Everything well, here's listed. my thing. I think I just said that wrong, and now I feel really dumb. No! <laughs> <laughs> okay, Wait. she grew up in a small village in north Denmark, because Denmark is a country, no? <laughs> I'm trying to make me look it stupid is. in front of our listeners. I'm so sorry. We said we're better, but we're also being honest. We are better, but we're also worse. Yeah. <laughs> I'm an idiot. And you know what? I, I just have to say, um, we took a mental health break. Honestly, I needed it more than Sherry. She's a lot more sane than I am. But I needed it. And I vacationed. I re relaxed. And I recharged. And I'm here. I cannot promise you that I am smart, but also since we've been catching up, we are three glasses of wine in, and that's just the way it's going to go today. Right. It's one of those. It's just going to go like that. So anyway, Hella grew up in a small village in the north part of Denmark, Okay. and she spent most of her youth learning and falling in love with language. She just kind of learned as many languages as she could. Badass. I mean... (laughs) so difficult to learn. It is very difficult. Like, and, and you and I are bilingual. Right. If some, some may even call me trilingual. Not to flex. Well, they won't. <laughs> Nobody would call me that. <laughs> but I speak, you and I both speak fluently English and Portuguese. And then I don't know if you did Spanish in school. You I did, did, right? did not did not retain one word. Oh, interesting. Not one See, vosotros. I, I was like, <laughs> okay, you retain vosotros. <laughs> Girl, use it in a sentence. That shit is hard. Um, but uh, yeah, so like I, I did like a Spanish exchange thing in high school. So I went to Spain and I lived with a student there and then like he came and lived with me. And then I had another person that I hosted. Shout out to Alba. She's not listening to this, but maybe I'll send it to her. (laughs) No, I'm just kidding. But like coming from people who know other languages, that shit is hard. It is hard to learn even just one other language. I'll tell you what, I'm fluent in Portuguese, but you catch me sometimes being like, what the hell does that mean? What word is that? Even in English, I don't know every word. So anyway, she was just a badass. She could soak in a new language and could take up all sorts of things and just talk to whoever she wanted at any point in time. This also, because of all of this, it made her like very passionate about traveling, which led to her wanting to choose a career as a flight attendant. I love that. Yeah, don't you? Like... I was saying to Matt when we were on the plane coming back from Mexico, I was like, just being a flight attendant is so bougie. 
it isn't it? It's such like a luxurious is. job. And I'm sure flight attendants everywhere are like, Helen, girl, you don't know how hard it is. And I'll tell you what, I believe that. But you look so good doing it. You are cordial, friendly, amazing. Traveling the world. The, the children on the plane lean on you to be your safety point. Like, what? I just, it's an underrated career. Those people are crazy cool at what they do. Truly. Pan Am World Airways was kind of looking for a stewardess, they used to call it. Now we say flight attendant because we are not... Barbaric? I don't even Barbaric. know. What, what, I don't even know what's wrong with that word. Is that I bad? Mean, I don't. I, don't I think know. it's just kind of like a fireman kind of thing. Like okay. it, it limits the position to a certain gender. Like you would say like firefighter instead because women can be fire fighters. Got it. You know. So flight attendants are bad. <laughs> flight attendants are badasses, and we don't call them stewardesses. Right. It's... So anyway, so Pan Am World Airways was looking for a flight attendant in the Copenhagen area. And she knew, like, oh, my God, that is the job for me. I speak every fucking language in the world. I love to travel. Name a better job. You can't. Okay, so when it came to making a podcast, we knew what we wanted to do, but we just didn't really know how to execute it. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. It's free. There's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you, so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. You can make money from this podcast too, like with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. She would then go on to be one of eight chosen out of 200 applicants. And then she went to Miami for training courses. I tell you what, like, (laughs) that alone would throw me off of applying. I'm such a freak when it comes to stuff like that. I'm like... There's no way I'm going to be chosen. So why do it? I mean, out of 200, that's intimidating as hell. Yeah. And like, yeah. While she was in Miami, she was living at a motel with lots of other employees, like flight attendants and pilots. And so she was able to make a lot of friends, both male and female. This is how she met Richard Crafts, who we know that this bitch changes her life. If you're here for the first time, sorry if that ruined it for you, but if you're here for the second time, you know this sleazy motherfucker's got to You know this dirt bag piece of shit is, is, we'll we'll see. Keep going, keep going. Let's go. Yeah. He is a 31-year-old pilot who was described as scruffy, 5'8", and an ordinary guy. Um, he was a playboy, kind of. That's what it was describing him as. I would never call a man a playboy. I think that's just so silly. Horny. Ew. It sounds like, gross. And he was, quote, never without a woman? I hate this man. It, like, this alone, throw him in the garbage. I just... Please. Because I bet it was, like, two girls and one of them was, like, his, like, sister or something. They're like, he's a playboy. I know. Like, who gave that quote to that magazine or article? Magazine, as if we research in magazines. I don't know why I said that. (laughs) Article. We found this all in Cosmo, you guys. Teen 17 or whatever the fuck that magazine was. Teen Beat Magazine. Oh, my God. What was it? 16 or something? Yeah, 16. Oh, I would always fill out the, the quizzes. Oh what if there was, like, an article on Richard Crafts and that? There wouldn't be. What are we talking about? This is what happens when you're three glasses of wine in. Focus, Helen. So, anyway, he would only date flight attendants. The article negates it by being, like, probably because he was always around them. But for me, it feels like it's a power thing because he's their boss. It's like, he would be me too to the fuck out of that fucking plane. Oh. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because he's dating flight attendants because he feels above them. That's why he's doing it. I fully Date a pilot, Richard. Date a pilot. pilot. Right. See, she'll give you a run for your fucking money, which is not a lot right now, but it will be. It will be. <laughs> He also, like, would always try to, like, charm these women by saying, like, all these stories about how he used to be in the CIA and how he fought in Indochina. Anyway, that's his, like, M.O. Okay. I think that I really, I, this was in our old episode, and I think it's really a good thing to keep in. Okay. So, in the notes, I, like, made a point to be, like, 
this article, it's it's a Pan Am World article, by the way. Oh. So like it's like it's pretty pretty legitimate yeah. source. If, yeah. Um, and they say, and I quote, standing just five foot eight with a medium frame, he seemed rather ordinary. <laughs> they also say that he's quote rough around the edges. And they literally say, quote, he wore his dark brown hair in an unkempt style that some women found appealing. Why are they trying to, why is this a Tinder profile? No, but but (laughs) they're like, he's not for everyone, I'll tell you that. But he's not for everyone. Yeah. He's, um, that's what they're saying. They're like, he's rough around the edges. Some women found him appealing. Others did not. I like that it's, (laughs) like, on one side, like, these are qualities that you might like, but this is backhanded as well. They're shading him to the, like, they're just literally like, hey, like, if you're into this, if you're into five foot eight, (laughs) I don't, I'm not telling you it's wrong, but only some people are. Right. (laughs) So, he does meet Hella, and they end up, like, getting together, um, and then she gets pregnant in 1975, and they get married right after they find out. So then they go on to settle in Newtown, Connecticut. It kind of sounds like, um, and like even Richard says himself later on, they really only got married because she was pregnant. Yeah. And it, it like, that's okay. Like, that's, people do that. People did that, especially then. Um, I'm sure people are still doing it now. You right, know? exactly. And, and like, do what you got to do. Do what you want to do. Whatever. But for this, like, it's important to kind of harp on that because they weren't really in love. So, like I said, they were, like, pretty strained from the beginning. Like, they had to think of, like, oh, we're having a baby, da-da-da. They didn't really get to have that, like, honeymoon phase where they fall in love and just, well, they should have been already in love, but you get what I'm saying. Yeah. So, and and it, the strain showed from the start. Richard had this, like, love for guns that really freaked Hella out. And she was, like, seen in public a few times with bruises that were not properly explained. Like, she would have different reasons for why she had these bruises. And it was never really good ones. Her friends also had, like, these very bad vibes about Richard. And they weren't afraid to tell it to his face. Like, they were like, Richard, bitch, you are sketchy. You. You. (laughs) You. You. They're like... Okay, Richard, I got my eye on you. So, and on top of that, he, on top of all of the nastiness, he is just power hungry. And I think we get that vibe from him being a pilot that dates strictly flight attendants. Like, that is a power hungry man. Um, He controlled all of the finances and he gave her literally no agency. Um, He was also able to spend his money however he wanted, and the money that she had in her possession always had to go towards the house and towards the bills. Fuck that. Yeah. He also decided to become an auxiliary police officer. I remember this. This shit grinds my gears. Because he took it so seriously. And thank you. Police officers should take their job seriously. It's a serious job. He wasn't being paid for how power hungry and crazy he was. This is a man who just wanted another form of like to have another position in power. So basically, from what I remember, tell me if I'm right, an auxiliary officer doesn't have any of the like things that you normally do as a cop. You just basically like you're like a volunteer. Yeah, like him arresting someone would be essentially a citizen's arrest. Yeah. Like with a little bit more of information. He is just a man who is working on his own accord and not being paid. But taking it so seriously as if he was. So crazy. And, like, I gotta say, like, I've never heard of this except for for him. So I don't know if it's even still a thing that happens. I feel like they would rather just police officers, like, go through the proper channels to become a police officer. And they don't really need volunteers. It's like, this isn't the PTA. Why are we having volunteer police officers? Can we just get people that know what they're doing? I feel like that's not a thing anymore. If it is, I'm going to stand outside of police officers' offices. Offices? The one office where I every can't. police I officer I have to go. Goodbye. To. I'm excusing myself. No, but I will stand outside of the, the police station is what their yeah, office is. Why couldn't station. I think of that? I'm going to stand out there with a sign that says, no good. No good. No good. <laughs> no good. It's you, Matt's waiting in the car. Matt, like, can I Helen, go? Can you hurry this up? It's too much. They understand it's no good. What's no good? They don't even know what you're talking about. I don't. <laughs> you're like, don't get it. No good. <laughs> anyway, 
so stupid. I don't. But so he has another form of power. And if you haven't gathered by all these bits and pieces of his personality, he is a literal piece of shit. Right. Okay. Let's talk about his like clash with being the police officer and the pilot. Because remember, he's a pilot. So in 1982, despite his responsibilities with Eastern, his flight company, and his house seemingly in need of constant repair. I don't, that is what the article said, and I don't know what that means. Like, okay. (laughs) Seemingly in need of constant repair. Like, who's, who are they throwing shade at here? Both of them. Richard, it seems like those floors need a lot of fixing. (laughs) Right. (laughs) What they mean. So backhanded. It's so sketchy. Now, he was not paid for this time, like I said, but he took the job so seriously that he would frequently hang around the police station, even when he was off duty, and sometimes would respond to police calls that he had no business responding to. Like, he'd just show up and be like, hey, boys, what are we doing here today? And they'd be like, Richard, go home, honey! Don't you have a family? You're off the clock, honey! Richard! I... Oh Richard. Like, he's, like, that guy. I know, work, exactly. That, yeah. like, inserts himself into conversations. Like, what are we talking about? Yeah. Oh, he's like, my God. Hey, you, guys, hey, you guys, I saw that you all came out here. Nobody called me. What's going on? Yeah. And they're like, yeah, Richard, nobody called you. Okay. Like, Richard, go home. Richard, you're embarrassing yourself. So, anyway. In 1986, he was hired as a police officer in the nearby town of Southbury. Now, listen to this. This is the kicker. Okay. His salary was $7 an hour. $7 an hour. And I know it's 1986, but he was a goddamn pilot. He made plenty of money. So for him to take this, like, side job for $7 an hour as a police officer, what did he need? He needed that title. That's 100% what he wanted. It is absolutely crazy. He also paid his own way for expensive training seminars that gave instructions on police procedures. I guess that's a good thing. That he got training, but I'm also just like, why are you working so hard for this? It's not even like he wanted to stop being a pilot to have this career as a police officer and he's paying for the training so he can make a career switch. He wanted both. Yeah. Like a freak. Sorry to anyone that's a pilot and a police officer. I just didn't even... That's like such a little kid thing. Like, what do you want to be when you grow up? Well, I want to be an astronaut and a princess. (laughs) I want to be a pilot and a police officer. And, like, the teacher's like, all right, well, um, that's cute and all, but you have to pick one. <laughs> yeah. Well, you could be an auxiliary police officer. Now, that's yeah, something you like, could do, Richard. I'll run with it. <laughs> <laughs> Stupid. No, fully, that's what he did. He was like, yes. <laughs> so hype. So, it said, I quote, because you know I would never say this shit on my own. Right. Crafts performed his police duties with a strange fervor and even purchased a 1985 Ford Crown Victoria, the same type of car the Connecticut State Police used. He outfitted it at his own cost with multiple radios, antennas, police lights, and a siren. Put this man in prison! I'm getting what secondhand is he is impersonating a police officer at this point, is he not? I mean, yes. buying a car that looks like the police officer's car and outfitting it all up to be a police officer's car, but nobody's told him to do that? It's sec- I'm getting secondhand embarrassed. I'm humiliated. He's humiliating. <laughs> I can't even Poor believe Helen. it. Yeah, he's he's the worst. <laughs> and like, just like this is like, just narcissism is just seeping out of this story. Like, there is just so much narcissism involved. I can't like wrap my head around it. Now we're gonna like kind of switch gears because we're gonna go back to their relationship. Okay. Hella started to get kind of like wary that he was kind of being, like, selfish, and and she kind of knew that he was still having these, like, affairs while they were having their marriage. Okay. I don't know why I said it like that. And and just, like, everything about him lately made her nervous. There was this constant number coming up on the phone bill, because this was, like, back when you got, like, a paper phone bill, and it said, like, all the numbers that you called. Yeah. You need to bring that back. I know. A couple like... people I need to invest again. <laughs> And on top of this constant number calling, Hella even found Christmas presents that he bought for another woman. Because she knew it because she never got that present. Why don't you use that money to fix the house that's in constant need of repairs? I thought your floors <laughs> needed fixing, Richard. <laughs> what the fuck are you doing? Richard, get a grip. 
So anyway, <laughs> I can just imagine how going around town like, yes, my last name. Did she take his last name? Yeah, she's like my last like name is Crabs. I know <laughs> she's person. like, uh. <laughs> and literally like she was just tolerating his shit because she was like, I don't want this shit to look bad. I have kids now. Like I gotta think of this stuff. Of so. Course. You know, she was just trying to make her marriage work, even though it was so shitty. And in the fall of 1986, she actually hired a divorce attorney and a PI to gather evidence about Richard's infidelity because she was like, I'm going to cut the fucking cord, (laughs) but I want to have good evidence. Good. So she also had a conversation with one of her divorce lawyers. I don't know why it says one of, because I don't know how many she had. (laughs) But we're going to get past that because it's not a big thing we need to spend time on. She said to him, if she ever goes missing, it was not an accident. I remember that really, like, hitting me. And I was like, ooh. I know. Yeah. And so the divorce was then drawn up on November 11th, but the papers were actually never served. So come November 18th, 1986, Hella landed in New York after attending a flight from Frankfurt, Germany. Her and two other flight attendants then drove to Newtown to drop off Hella, which I have to say, if they're coming from New York and they're not from Newtown, they are loyal as hell to drop her off. That's That's two hours. (laughs) That is like an hour and a half with no traffic and driving 90. Mm -hmm. Like, (laughs) you know, I'm just saying they're good friends. And that, unfortunately, was the last time that Hella was seen alive. On the night of November 18th, Dawn Marie Thomas, who is Hella and Richard's live-in nanny slash au pair, depending on which article you read. Don't know the like, difference, but... I guess an au pair is, like, a live-in nanny, and a nanny is just, like, maybe comes every day, but, like, lives at her own house. Yeah. But as far as I know, Dawn Marie Thomas sleeps at their house, so she's, like, an au pair. How rich. Anyway, <laughs> she testified that she was working at McDonald's in Danbury, um, just about 20 minutes away from Newtown. And, you know, we know this area. Yeah. We're not. We're like, not strangers. Like, it's so funny because the first time that we recorded this, we were like, oh, my God, don't tell anyone we know the area. We don't want stalkers. Oh, and it's like, please, bitch. <laughs> but, so she was at working at McDonald's in Danbury, which was 20 minutes away until about two in the morning. Now, that night was stormy and the craft house actually lost power. So Richard woke Dawn up early with the kids and had them leave to go to Richard's sister's house in Westport, which is about 40 minutes away. He returned back to Newtown for the day, and he said that he would pick them all up later that evening. Now, this is, like, the big thing. So pay attention to the timing here. Obviously, Hella is nowhere to be seen during all this. And when Richard picks the kids up and Dawn, they're like, hello, where's Hella? Where's mom? Mm -hmm. You know? And Richard tells them that Hella had left for Denmark to be with her mother, who is sick. Got it. And then Richard tells a bunch of stories about where Hella is. Yeah, he gets very loosey-goosey on facts. He gets very (laughs) loosey-goosey. He just forgets that he's supposed to be... (laughs) Alibi. I'm sorry, you guys. Sherry just almost spilled wine on my floor, and that freaked me and out. And I had to clutch it. But he's getting, he's very loose with details. We're like, um, where's your wife? And it doesn't, at one point, he says she's in the Canary Islands. Girl. Okay. He claimed that she was on another flight, which A, is not allowed. When you have a long flight, like from Frankfurt, Germany to New York City, You've got to take a breather. They don't let you do another flight because they want flight attendants to be pleasant and aware and alert. Because think about if that plane crashes, that bitch needs to be alert. Alert. She needs to be ready to do the job of saving lives and helping people. And you can't do that if you're overexhausted and tired. So they don't let you. So him being like, oh, she's on another flight. It's like, yeah, try again, buddy. I know that that she's not. All right. I actually called Pan Am and your ass is grass. That's, fuck you, Richard. I I got no time for that lie. Then he goes, well, yeah, she's like visiting her mother in Denmark. And then her mom calls everyone and is like, no, I'm, I'm not sick. I feel good. And I, she didn't come by here. It's like, there's... excuse me. And then he was like, 
Oh, she might be in Florida or the Canary Islands. Yeah, and it's like excuse that was the most me? ridiculous one that oh. I held on to. Excuse me, Florida or the Canary Islands? <laughs> You've got to pick one because she told you she was going to one place, <laughs> and you don't know whether she told you Florida. Or the- I'm sorry, are you getting her mixed up with your mistress who is in Florida, Richard? This isn't funny. Where is she, Richard? Richard, I know she told you where she is. Where is she? If I were the investigating officer. I'm telling you. Not you implementing yourself. Richard yourself. Cross would be no more. <laughs> no more. It's too much. Get your fucking story straight, Richard. God. If I were his defense attorney, oh. Richard, you're humiliating me. Richard, we're supposed to be on the same page. Why'd you drive you said, your cop car Richard, here? you told me Florida, you told the cops, the Canary Islands. This shit doesn't add up. Richard, get it together. But I'm a cop. Richard. I'm a cop. Richard, you are not a cop. Richard, you... You work for $7 an hour, and that's because you begged them to pay you. <laughs> Richard, you're embarrassing us all. Richard, stop saying you're a cop. No one believes you. Richard, I don't. She can't possibly be on another flight. There's a resting period. Her mom's not even sick, Richard. What are you talking about? God, I, that's it. I recuse myself. <laughs> judge, judge, and like a recess, please. <laughs> Get it together, Alan. You got a story to tell. Back on track, everybody. <laughs> Sherry's gonna be wheezing for a few more minutes. Don't mind no, her. Really, but I have my um my albuterol. I have a new rescue inhaler, guys. Good girl. Thanks. I've talked about this in a previous episode, but you guys should see Sherry and her boyfriend both using their inhalers like at dinner. Like, don't make them laugh at dinner. They will take their inhalers. <laughs> We're not afraid. We'll pull it out. I don't care. <laughs> It's amazing. Okay, so a few days after all of these lies that Richard told to anybody with ears, um, Dawn, the living nanny au pair, spotted a big stain on the carpet of Richard and Hella's bedroom floor. Now, I don't know if Dawn said something to Richard about this stain, but just a few minute or so later i don't know when it doesn't really say it says subsequently subsequently the carpet was removed and the bedroom was redone bedding and all i think that's another thing we get into later on yes or, we but, will okay mm-hmm. all right i'm gonna shut the yep. fuck up no it's this bitch is stupid richard <sighs> okay so hella actually isn't reported officially missing until december 1st So, if you guys need a little bit of a recap, because we have been talking a lot. I do. I'm three glasses of wine, dude, please. (laughs) Yeah. She, the night of November 18th is when we're to believe that Hella went missing. The last time that she was ever seen was November 18th, when her flight attendant friends dropped her off. And she was never seen again. So now this is so many days later. December 1st is when she's reported missing. And... This is 1986, I believe. Yeah, 1986. So my thing is that, like, I get it that there wasn't, like, a big, like, need to be in constant contact. It's not like they were writing fucking letters to each other. But, like, there were pay phones in 1986. And you bet your ass if they were married and she, like, she cares about her kids. She just does. So she would be calling on pay phones or, like home landlines and shit of wherever if she's in florida or wherever the fuck she is she would be checking in and it's weird that he doesn't report her missing until december 1st because it's like richard have you not heard from her for this long and you waited until now like it doesn't make any sense for you know for him to be innocent in all of this yeah according to richard he tells the police that he had an argument with her she left and never returned This is another thing. Let's say that that's true. She wouldn't just get up and leave and never see her kids again. At all. They would have to come to... Especially because we know she was drafting a divorce agreement. Mm -hmm. So, like, she was trying to leave him in the first place. She wasn't just going to get up and leave everything. You know? Yeah. It doesn't add up. So, Hella's friends then come forward and they tell the police that, like, she must be in danger or worse. Like... They're like, there's no way. She had allegedly told them that Richard was dangerous and that her life was at stake. And at this point, 
police are like, okay, that really embarrassing Richard guy, we know him to be a little bit introverted, a little bit of a freak, but we don't think he's alarming because they're like, he's one of us, kind of. A little. Oh God. On the side. For they're free. they're barely <laughs> getting out the words. He he's He's one of one he of, well he wants to be well he's I guess, forget about it. Whatever. He frequents the police station. Yeah. I don't <laughs> If at most he's a visitor. <laughs> and so they really don't have a lot to go on at this point. And, like, because he's the, like, semi-police officer that he is, they don't think he's an alarming person. This is what's wrong with policing. Even if you don't think a person's alarming, why don't you just vet it anyway? Yeah. Just say you were able to look into it and then you could close the door instead of just being like, nah, I'm not worried. It's not going to take that much time out of your day. And if so. it does, so be it. That's the job you signed up for. I hate to tell you, but police officers are supposed to investigate. Which is their job, strangely yeah. enough. It'd be like if someone asked me to draft up a document and I was like, no, 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 I don't have time for that. It's like, that's what they're paying me for. I have to. You would get fired on the spot. Well, my company, I don't know. Really? They would. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, they're I too nice. I think they would just say, Helen, get your shit together. I know. I'm like, I wonder how you guys found me because I'm so good. Uh, I don't know. Like, is that weird to say? And, like, I'm not saying that my company won't fire anyone. I'm sure that they will. But I think that they would first give me a slap on the wrist and say, Helen, get your shit together. This isn't like you. Because usually when they give me a task, I'm like, right on it. I'll do it right now, this second. And ten minutes later, I'm like, here it is. I dropped everything to do it. At its core, it's just a ridiculous thing because, A, they don't really believe it because he's a police officer. And then B, like, they're like, well, she's an adult. I'll tell you Mm. what, adults go missing all the goddamn time. And a lot of the times, it's really bad circumstances. So, can we please just look into it? Even if they're an adult, even if they left on their own accord, let's say that they left on their own accord with confidence because we looked into it. Exactly. And it's like, after all these different, like, I don't know, not testimonies, but all these different accounts of how much of a bad person he is and how dangerous he is. It's like, don't you think those are circumstances that would elevate it to be like, hmm, maybe we should look into this? Why are you overlooking that? Exactly. So, to you and I, simpletons, it's very clear that Richard killed her. No? Yes. Yeah. So, let's just go through the day as we know it. Okay. According to the Hartford Current... Prosecutors said that Richard Crafts bought a large freezer on November 17th, 1986. Now, I'll tell you what, this is the day before she goes missing. This is the type of freezer that, like, someone who hunts, like, big animals would have because they would, like, keep... They need the space for it. But Richard didn't hunt. And, And did he have the time? No. He filled his day up with all sorts of nonsense. So this is our first red flag, the freezer. Yeah. Red flag number two. On November 20th, a snowplow driver claimed that he saw Richard driving around Newtown and Southbury. And these are two, like, towns right on the border of each other. And actually, um, the bridge that we're going to be talking about is, like, I don't truly know if it's Newtown or Southbury. I think it's Newtown, but then, like, right after the bridge, it becomes Southbury. So, yeah. like, it's they, they share water that the bridge goes over or whatever. So, they're literally beside each other. He was seen using a wood chipper at the Silver Bridge. When confronted about what he was doing, Richard claimed that he was clearing limbs that fell onto his property. Now, after an assessment of both scenes, no limbs were found. And I'll tell you what, the storm that they had was a snowstorm. So, like... The limbs that were found on his property, if they mattered to him, they would have been big fucking limbs. Yeah. You know what I mean? It, it wouldn't, wouldn't be... be, like, a twig here and there that he feels inclined to clean up during a blizzard. You would think, like, a almost, maybe this is dramatic, but, like, a whole tree fell down. And you're like, right, oh, right. this really needs and to like, get out of my And, like, compromising lawn. the safety of his house that needs to constantly be fixed. And he's like, no, not one more thing. <laughs> yeah. In my yeah. notes, I didn't even read them, but I said the same sentence I just said. Really? I'm like, mind you, this is a day after a snowstorm. <laughs> I love how well you know yourself. My brain is just crazy. So anyway, I literally wrote, so I'll let you assess how likely it is that making wood chips were at the top of this man's list that day. <laughs> it definitely wasn't. 
I mean, really, what do you need that for? Could you just wait? Your kids are in Westport. You need to spend time with them. It's a blizzard. They're scared. You carted them off in the middle of the night, basically. Like, what's going on, Richard? Don't make wood chips at the Silver Bridge right now. Obviously, at this point, police are starting to feel a little suspicious of the guy. Thank you. Finally. I would hope. Finally. So they start interviewing people who are close to Hella, and they find that Richard's stories have not exactly lined up. Really? I know. Are you like, sure? No, no, we knew that, you guys, but thank you for catching up. Now yeah. that you're here, would you like a cup of coffee? Right, can we- Here, you guys like donuts. You want one? <laughs> like, can we please be awake and alert? Yeah. Like we said before, he had told a lot of people that he was visiting her mother, that she was visiting her mother in Denmark. When contacted, Hella's mother, like I said, was like, no, girl, I'm healthy. <laughs> There's no visits to be had. Eventually, I don't know, I guess he, like, gives up on that. And then he's just like, you know, I've got no clue where she is to the police. And they're like, all right, why wouldn't you just say that in the first place? Why did you send us on a wild goose chase to the Canary Islands? <laughs> like, to call Hella's mother who gave us an <laughs> earful <laughs> talking to us about her yeah. health. And, and the language barrier of it all. You gave us the biggest <laughs> headache of all. Oh, my God. So now police have a reason to look into what exactly Richard was doing on the day of Hella's disappearance. Because now we see, oh no, Richard, this is not as sweet as it sounds. Yeah. They look into his financials and they find that he rented a wood chipper and a large truck just one day after Hella was last seen. A day before she was last seen on November 17th is when he bought the large chest freezer. Now police go to the live-in nanny, Dawn Marie Thomas, to find out what she might know. All right, okay. Doesn't it remind you, doesn't that sentence kind of remind you of Hamilton? Let's let them know what we, we know. know. <laughs> yes! The police going to Don Marie. Let's let her know what we know. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> that's for a very small group of people yeah. who might like this and Hamilton. <laughs> Turns out, Don was working a shift at McDonald's, like she had said, the night before the storm and didn't arrive home until 2 a.m., which she promptly went to bed and didn't get the chance to see Richard or Hell. Now, Richard knew that she does this. They know her well because she lives with them. And he knew that when she works really late, she goes right up to bed and she doesn't check in with anyone because everyone's supposedly sleeping. Just so you know. The next morning, like we said, she was woken up early and carted off to Westport. And when I say carted off, like, I feel like this bitch didn't even take off her sleep mask. And he was like, get get in the car. Go, go. (laughs) She was like, can I brush my teeth? I don't. (laughs) At this point, Dawn was in the dark about Hella's whereabouts. Later, when they returned to the house, Dawn recalls seeing and she said it was a large grapefruit sized dark red stain on the carpet, which after she said something about it, it was removed. Armed with this new information, this is my <laughs> sen- <laughs> this is my sentence from my notes from before and I just have to say it again because I loved this sentence That's when I said so it. Good. Armed with this new information, police officers haul ass to the Silver Bridge. <laughs> traumatic but i mean i'm sure that's exactly what they thought they're like we're oh, done you behind. said what let's get to the silver bridge people back up we need backup at the silver bridge i heard that there was a wood chipper at the silver bridge you know the one between newtown and southbury yeah they she they share water i don't know if it's newtown or southbury do you know if it's newtown or south just get there people get there we've got ass hauling to do i mean they're weeks behind yeah it's pathetic it's really pathetic honestly i mean I- I don't know. We'll leave it at that. I know that there were so many bad bitches behind Hella that were alerting the police the whole time of everything, but they were too busy listening to a dumb man instead. I This is what makes me mad. You know, I am not overly crazy about my feminism. I just think that we, I'm not like asking for too much. I'm just asking to be heard and to be equal. And guess what? This tells me that shit's Never going to be. Because the fact that they don't even apologize for not hearing out all these women that were like, hello, she told us she's in danger. And they're like, no, we'll listen to like the know, husband. Like, the he's husband a volunteer knows. police officer. And forget about all the power trip crazy shit that we know. Like, they know that he's a pilot who dates flight attendants. Red flag. Mm-hmm. That's already a power hungry bitch. They know that he's a volunteer police officer on top of that because he'd rather do that than go home to his fucking children. 
already another red flag. And then on top of all that, they're like, yeah, we're getting these reports that he was like a really bad guy and that his wife is missing and that she's probably in danger. And she's seen over town with like but unexplained But can bruises. we really believe a woman or several? I feel like we should just believe that sketchy guy that we don't really like that much that's embarrassing himself every time we turn around. <laughs> Look at, you know, Richard, the one that has that car. Richard, the guy who keeps showing up here. Keep showing up here. Richard, that guy? Yeah, I'd rather believe him over a woman. Right. Yeah. I mean, what else is there to it? It's despicable. Despicable. I don't know what else to say. So anyway, turns out Richard isn't who they thought he was. (laughs) (laughs) That was my next line in my notes. Okay, I'm going to stop reading from my notes. Um, So then they searched the area, which turned up an envelope, which was addressed to Hella Crafts. Oh, my Girl, goodness. don't even. Pieces of bone and tissue. Yeah. A human nail. Uh-huh. And a chip tooth. Right. Eventually, Richard, who maintains his innocence, gets to the scene with Hella's brother. And uh, this will go down in history books as one of the dumbest things a man has ever said. He says to Hella's brother, who, guess who's Hella's brother gonna pick? Is it Hella or Richard? Let's just take a wild guess on who he's going to pick. He says to Hella's brother, let them dive. There's no body. It's gone. What do you think this bitch thinks right away? He's like, I'm telling the police. I'm alerting the authorities. You just said that, you freak. What's wrong with you? Why would you say that to me? Like, literally. So after they searched the water that runs underneath the bridge, they found a chainsaw with a serial number, which was scratched off, that had blood, tissue, and hair fragments on it. And now this is when we're going to try to get a little bit forensic-y and very cool. And this is my favorite thing about true crime is the forensics of it all. Same. I love it. Um, but this is a lot of stuff that they've got now to, to take to the lab. Yeah, I think this is enough to go off, yeah, right? That, well, they're like, we don't know if it's enough to go off because it's 1986 and we don't know a goddamn thing about anything, but I'll tell you what, they do some good work. Okay. So, Richard was then asked to take a lie detector test, which, like, why is this the first time he's asked to take it? And also, why is, he is a volunteer police officer, he should know better, but guess what? His ass takes it. The polygraph examiner admits that he passed... With very little emotion. So, I don't know if you guys know how lie detector tests work, but they basically get, like, a gauge of, like, what your emotions are generally like. So, they'll ask you regular questions like, what's your name? Where do you live? Like, easy questions to answer because that will give you, like, a base pace of where your heart rate's at and, like, if you're clammy or not. And, like, you know, those kind yeah, of things. Yeah, it measures that, like, all the telltale signs that your body would emit you're, if you're yeah, lying. Exactly. And so he had, like, no emotion throughout the whole thing. So, of course, he passed, but they were like, but is it, like, rehearsed that he had no emotion? Or, like, you know, is he on purpose lying with a blank face? Like, because, you know, these things are not... Yeah, lie detector tests have recently not been... I don't even they're think they're bullshit. allowed in... Cool. I, yeah. yeah, they're bullshit. And then we know that now. They were pretty, re- re- pretty heavily relied on back then, but they're bullshit. So, Henry Lee was then called to the case. Now, this guy is super respected in the forensics industry, at least then, um, because he is the guy who, like, goes on to testify in the OJ case, and he helps the police search Richard's home. He also did a bunch of other stuff that... I'm forgetting, because it's not in my notes, but anyway, he was... He was the... He was forensic, iconic. Yeah. He was the iconic forensic analyst of yeah. the 1900s. Um, him holding up the glove. Yeah. No, I don't think no, he did that. No, but no, anyway, no. he was on that case. Yeah. <laughs> um... So, okay, so he then goes with the police to search Richard's home. On the mattress, five tiny stains were discovered that later were proved to be blood. Now, an antigen test revealed that the blood was type O positive and that the blood was circulation blood, meaning that a blood vessel had to be injured. Now, here's the thing. When I hear, ooh, blood on a mattress, how humiliating. Don't humiliate Hella like that. Because I'm like, how many times have I bled on my mattress by accident? Menstruation is not something to be ashamed of, ladies. Anyway, so this is circulation blood. So we can rule out menstruation because the menstrual blood doesn't go through, like, blood veins and it's not, like, pumping through your body. So, like, that, like, that is why it matters that it's circulation blood because it means that she was cut to get that blood out of her body. 
Now, after some investigating of the scene, a six-inch bloodstain was spotted on the side of the bed consistent with a blow to the head. Like, as if she was, like, sitting next to the bed. And then it sort of, like, spat- spattered onto the yeah, wall. It's so, so cool how they could tell that. So, the bathroom towels had also recently been washed, but when they were tested with a liquid chemical called OTO, um, it turns out that the towels had been soaked with blood. The chainsaw that was mentioned earlier that kind of like seemed like a dead end because the serial number was scratched off actually was not a dead end because forensic experts were able to use this like chemical solution that basically just eroded the scratches and like reversed him scratching off the serial number. Like they were like, just kidding. (laughs) (laughs) It's like when your parent buys you that like journal where you can write down whatever the hell you want with your one special pen but they also bought their own special light for it so they can read whatever you said didn't happen to me but uh (laughs) such betrayal i don't want to get into my past right now thank you though (laughs) so anyway they could figure out what the serial number said um and guess who owned the chainsaw (laughs) richard it was richard Every single one of the 2,660 hairs found on the chainsaw and at the river were also examined under a microscope. And the hairs seemed to be cut, but not with scissors. So they then compared them to the hair on Hella's hairbrush, and they were able to draw a match. Now, the nail polish that was on the fingerprint found was also analyzed against a bottle that was on Hella's nightstand, and that also turned up to be a match. Still, however, we don't really have full-on evidence that Hella is dead. Right. Because no body, as Richard out- outed to the world yeah, at the scene. Yeah, like, you can look, but you can't find it. So anyway, without a body, the forensic experts have this, like, huge burden to prove that, like, she didn't disappear, but she, in fact, died. And you may have heard, like, in the past, in cases that, like, they can say, like, well, this is so much blood that no one could have survived this. They don't even really have that. But they have all these things that it's like, well, it's pretty much that. It's pretty much a done deal, you know? Right. So, experts on the case actually figured that if they could just prove that Hella was put into that wood chipper, they could prove that she didn't survive it. Yeah. So, they decide to do an experiment by getting... Oh, so... Oh, wait. It's, it's cool, cool, but it's, but it's sad, sad, right? <laughs> it's really cool because it's like, wow, somebody thought of that and this is getting us justice. But it's also sad. So, they decide to do an experiment by getting the same model of wood chipper... And putting a pig through it to see what it would do to the pig's bones. Now, I know that that's really gross and it kind of seems random. But by doing this, it would actually give them an idea of, like, where the body would have gone. And also, like, what type of cuts would be on the body. Because the wood chipper would have, like, these signature cuts. Now, the blades basically made a specific pattern so that if they could match the ones produced to the pig's bones to the debris found at the river, they could prove that Hella was in that wood chipper. The bone fragments found at the scene were then looked at in depth, and it was a match. And they also put the bone fragments under a microscope, and they could see, like, the small grooves that were formed by blood vessels, something that only human bones have. I mean, just so cool. Skull fragments from the side of the head were also able to be identified. These proved to be the most important because if you're suffering a blow to the head in this type of way, it probably does mean that you're dead. Again, the bone fragments were tested and they were revealed to be belong to a person with O positive blood, which we know that Hella had. Richard Crafts was then arrested and charged with the murder of his wife. He was held on a 750000 bond, and his three kids were removed from custody and put into the custody of his sister in Westport. So, let me just try to, like, paint a picture of what I think exactly went down. Okay. After putting the kids to bed on November 18th, Hella changed into her favorite blue nightshirt and went to her room. There she got into an argument with Richard. He hit her over the head with his police flashlight, ugh, who gave them that, and killed her. Richard then put Hella's body into the freezer and cleaned up as much of the scene as possible. Dawn, the nanny, returned home around 2 a.m. and went straight to bed, like we know. 
Early in the morning, then Richard took the kids and nannies to his and nanny to his sister's house, rented the largest commercial wood chipper he could find, and a U-Haul using his credit card. Richard then transported the remains, a chainsaw, and some wood to the river. He was then spotted by the snowplow driver around 3 a.m. Idiot. Richard then dismembered Hella's frozen body and put the wood chippers through and put wood through the chipper along with her body pieces. This meant that there would be, like, very little blood at the scene because not only is her body frozen, but it's going in at the same time as the wood. So, I kind of feel like the fight could have been about the phone bill. Yeah. Because as you can remember, there was that piece of mail with her. And I'm thinking to myself, like, why would there be mail in her nightshirt? I think also... Except for that if she was holding on to it to give him evidence, you know? Yeah, and I think another theory, I don't know if it's one that I had or one that I read about when um, we were looking at this case, was that that night she meant to, like, confront him almost, which is why it was with, like, on her person. Right, exactly. Like, so I I think think that... I don't think that's far-fetched to say. I think that they literally got into an argument because she was confronting him about the phone bill, and that, like, led to him killing her. But the crazy thing about it, though, is... He bought the freezer November 17th. So it's telling me, like, no matter what she would have done that night, he's a piece of garbage and he was going to do to her no matter what. Like, people can try to victim blame and be like, well, she should have known that bringing that up could have put her in danger. But here's the thing. He bought that freezer earlier. There was nothing she could have done to change her fate. Yeah. And also to those people, fuck off. I know. Don't you hate that? Like, whenever people respond to things being like, couldn't she have done this, though? Like, with the Shanann Watts. Oh, my God. Like, people just can be people without expecting to be killed. That's just yeah. the way it should be. <laughs> no one asks for that. It's so crazy. So, okay. Richard actually had two trials because the first trial was held at the Danbury Superior Court and it ended in a mistrial because everybody knew about it. The second trial was then moved to New London, where his guilty verdict was rendered in 1989. He was sentenced to 50 years in prison, and this case ended up being the first murder conviction in Connecticut without a victim's body present. In 1993, he tried to appeal with no success. However, he ended up serving a shorter sentence because of this stupid fucking old sentencing law called good time, statutory good time. Um, basically this means that, like, you can get an extensive time taken off of your sentence if you're just a good guy, and it's like, I don't care. Anybody can put up a front. Like, and also, like, I'm sorry, but even if you're a good guy, like, you did that thing, and you should serve your time for it. 100%. Because why even make up that amount of years to serve for that crime if you're just gonna exit out later on? Yeah, and what does it tell people? You can do a really bad crime, but if you're a good boy in prison, then, like, go ahead. You'll be out on the streets to do that crime again whenever you want. Like, no! Make him serve the fucking time. It drives me freaking nuts. So, Richard actually got a disciplinary infraction from having contraband in his jail cell, but he still got out early. That didn't even affect his good time, because that is the world that we live in. And on top of this, he was credited for the three years that he spent between sentencing and his conviction. Which is just bullshit, because during that time, guess where he was living? At home. Not in prison. Yeah. Yeah. Although the case was up for revision, they have to reply, apply the law that was in place at the time of sentencing, so they were able to give him the good time. Well, they actually had to. Today, Richard is out, and he's in transitional housing in Bridgeport. Um, the most recent articles I could find were January and February of 2020, saying that he would be released in July 2020, but I didn't find anything more recent, and I don't know if that's just because, like, no one's checking up on this bitch, which that makes me a little nervous, or if it's because, like, COVID derailed everything, and I don't really know. Um, another really quick thing I want to add about this case is that it has been featured in some pretty cool pop culture things. Um... First of all, it inspired the first episode of Forensic Files, which is just cool in its own right. And this is such a cool, monumental forensic case for Connecticut, so that's amazing. Um, But also, if you're a fan of the movie Fargo, it is actually um, the inspiration that the Coen brothers had to make it. Of course, the movie is not about the Helicrafts case, but it has some pieces, and if you've seen the movie, you know why. Um... And it also is an episode of Law and Order Criminal Intent. So, Hella, 
She died too soon. It's a tragedy. Um, she was a badass. She was really cool. But a lot of people cared about her and she did not go in vain. No. We're still talking about her today. And she's a part of huge, huge things in our media. Thanks for listening. You can follow us on Instagram at the Chalkline Pod, Twitter at the Chalkline Pod, and be sure to check out our YouTube channel. The link is in our Instagram bio. Tune in next Thursday for another story.